NASA spends lots of time and resources studying the weather. And winter weather is particularly important. That's why NASA sponsors the History of Winter Workshop for Teachers. We'll take you to a frozen Lake Placid to learn about the tools that measure the conditions of our coldest season, next on Real World. Winter conditions here on Earth are very important to NASA scientists and engineers. The agency's aeronautics mission relies on data gathered during the coldest part of the year. They use it to develop systems that will allow planes to fly better and safer in winter conditions. The exploration mission studies winter conditions too. Data related to harsh winter-like conditions here gives scientists perspective about other places in the universe, like the moon or Mars. Now that we're discovering it more closely, ice on other planets, uh, it's important to understand the properties. Alan Lunsford is a NASA computer scientist and history of winter technologist. Not only of natural ice on Earth, but ice that forms in other conditions that you don't find on Earth. Higher pressures, lower pressures, different temperature regimes. So the same concepts that we learn here at Howe are the concepts that are used by scientists to study ice all over the solar system. Teachers come to Lake Placid, New York and become scientists for a week, rolling their sleeves up and taking a hands-on approach to understanding winter. One of the things these teachers slash scientists do is learn how to measure abiotic conditions of winter. Abiotic conditions are all the non-living elements of an ecosystem, like air and soil and snow and ice. At Lake Placid, they use lots of tools for measuring these conditions. One of the simplest tools to measure ice is called a thermocron, and teachers at History of Winter get a lot of use out of this tool. Thermocron is a little data logger. It has a clock and a little computer and some memory, so it keeps track of time and temperature. It's really kind of small, compact, and rugged, so you can connect it to a computer and program it to record the temperature every minute, every two minutes, whatever you like. It's rugged enough that you can bury it in the sand or put it underwater or put it in a snowpack and later retrieve it, connect it to the computer again, download the data, and analyze the temperature history that the Thermocron experienced. Here's an experiment you can do with the Thermocron. Drop it in a glass of water, put the glass in the freezer, and let it freeze. Then take it out of the freezer and let it melt. This is gonna take a little while. Once it's back to room temperature, pull the Thermocron out and check the data on a computer. That's a great experiment to show them the concept of the latent heat, where it'll start warm and it'll come down to the freezing point of water, zero degrees, and then it'll stay zero for a long time as all the water in that cup freezes. And then once it's all frozen, only then does the ice start to get colder and it'll get as cold as a freezer. When you take it out of the freezer, it'll get warmer really quickly, right up to zero. And then it'll stay zero for a long time until all that ice is melted. And then it'll get room temperature. Those little areas there where it maintains that temperature, even though it's absorbing heat or releasing heat, is that the latent heat concept. Another abiotic condition that scientists want to learn more about is snow. And there are lots of ways they measure snow at how. You actually use what's called a snowboard. Tom Elena is a meteorologist at Talcott Mountain Science Center. Not a fancy thing you go downhill snowboarding in. It's a piece of plywood, maybe two by two. You place it on the surface of the snow before the storm, and every six hours or so you measure the accumulation on that board. But then you have to reset the board, cleaning the accumulated snow off. This is very important. The more snow that's on it, it's going to compact the snow. So if you went two days after a storm and just measured the one, one measurement, you might have a, a little less snow than it really did fall. It's also important to measure the density of the snow. We can calculate using those snow tubes, putting them on a weight, a certain known volume with a weight, grams per cubic centimeter, and we can get densities. Scientists use this information to determine the snow water equivalent. This is the amount of water contained within a snowpack. A layer of snow, how much water would be if you melted that down? 
good start is 10 to 1. So 10 inches of snow would melt down to a one inch layer of water. Cold, dry, fluffy snow. That could be 20, even 30 to 1. The very heavy stuff, sleet, is like almost 2 to 1. And ice, of course, would be a 1 to 1. More data about snow density can be recorded simply by observing the snowflakes. If they come out of the cloud base at that point, they are beautiful. They're like little glass sculptures. However, if they continue going through a lot of cloud, the cloud droplets stick to it. It's called rhyming. Those crystals tend to have a lower snow ratio. Moisture and temperature, very important variables in the cloud. There are a lot of very practical reasons to study snow density. It's very important in watershed resources. In the western United States where the Sierra Nevada harbor the entire summer water supply for much of the big cities, people there are doing core samples all the time in the snow to look how deep, how what is its density, and calculate how much water is up there for the spring and early summer melt. Studying snow density can also help predict avalanche dangers. When snow of different densities gets layered, one on top of the other, layers tend to slip, especially when you get a layer of low-density icy snow. That ice layer can really act as a slippery surface for a brand new snowfall. That's usually there where you'd expect the slippage. So now you see why it's important to study about these topics. But from NASA's perspective, the best reason to bring these teachers up here is so that they bring back great ideas to the classroom, teaching kids to grow up thinking like scientists. And those kids will be the ones who lead NASA forward through the next generation and continue exploring our world and the worlds beyond.